Potawatomi, arts, culture, and entertainment. This is a Pace production. So what's the allure of terrifying tales anyway? Why are so many people interested in the unknown? You know, it's been said that we humans have a fascination for things we don't understand. Do you believe that? I don't know. I tried to give it some thought. I I tried to think of something I positively don't understand. I came up with calculus. And no disrespect to any mathematicians in the audience, but I can assure you that the subject matter is something that holds very little fascination for me. Of course, the big mystery, I suppose, is why I was able to find my college calculus book in my house to get this photograph 45 years after having taken the class. I guess I just wanted to hang on to it in case I got around to reading it someday, which could have something to do with the lack of understanding. So there must be more to the allure than that, but whatever the allure, this evening we're going to talk about some things that are likewise difficult to understand, but actually are indeed captivating. December 17, 1977, something happened in Big Lake Park. 43 years later, nobody knows what that something was, but something did happen in Big Lake Park. I mean, there's no question, there was a fireball of molten metal in Big Lake. 11 independent witnesses, the Council Bluffs Fire Department and the Council Bluffs Police Department can all confirm that. Now, how it got there, or what it was, remains a mystery. So December 17, uh, Saturday evening, 7.45 p.m., a week before Christmas, three teenagers decided to do some Christmas shopping. So they headed out to Richmond Gordon, which at that time was on North 16th, about where the Walmart is today. But before they got in the store, they looked over and saw a reddish object in the sky, about 500 feet in the air, and it was falling straight down. It disappeared behind the trees of Big Lake, followed by a flash of bluish-white light and two plumes of fire reaching over 10 feet in the air. So they got back in their car and drove to the park to check it out. Now, a few blocks away, 24-year-old Mike Moore and his wife were driving along West Broadway. They saw the same thing, so they headed north on 16th Street to the park to check it out. Now, interestingly, Mike Moore, his father, was uh, the assistant, assistant fire chief at that time, and he responded to this call. A small foreign car with four teenagers was there when the first witnesses arrived, but it quickly sped off. The fire department was on the scene in less than 15 minutes, and they found this glowing molten metal, six foot by four foot, four inches thick. They said it kind of looked like a giant sparkler and it ignited a small grass fire. Uh, Chief Moore requested a police cruiser. The police arrived, they contacted Epley Airfield and off at Air Force Base, but neither said that any airplanes had crashed that night. So, must have been a meteorite, no big deal. And not so. Bob Allen, uh, the Doppel's astronomy expert, visited the site and he discounted this as a meteor fall. So the metal was analyzed, and it turned out not to be kryptonite or some exotic extraterrestrial element, but rather carbon steel, a common manufacturing element called, or metal called slag, that was readily available at two Council Bluffs foundries, Cattleman and, uh, and over at Griffin. So after that, most people lost interest, but not so fast. I grew up in Council Bluffs. I spent a lot of time on our parks, and I can assure you molten metal is not a standard feature of the Council Bluffs park system. So there's more to the story here than meets the eye. Now, this is not the first sighting of a UFO in Council Bluffs. I found this newspaper clipping. Uh, It was of a very peculiar and brilliant light passing over the city one evening. Now, let me just read this in short, in case you can't see from the back of the room. It says, the shape of the machine could be, be distinctly seen. It was like a boat, and had something on each side, which seemed to be like wings. It was brilliantly lighted. At least two reputable citizens saw it. Okay, two wings extending from an object? Isn't that what we would call an airplane? Not so fast. This newspaper clipping is from April 1879. Troubling thought. Airplanes hadn't been invented yet. Okay, 1966, we have something even better than a sighting. The holy grail of a UFO experience photographic evidence. A student at Eastside Junior High sighted a flying saucer that landed in his backyard. Well, he had the presence of mind to grab his trusty brownie camera and rush to the door and managed to snap a picture. We classmates of his were totally 
blown away by this. This was the proof we were seeking. So we went to the school telephone booth, ripped the city map out of the phone book, and divided the city into sections. And that night, we were going to take our walkie-talkies and get on our bicycles and scour the city, and we were going to find more information about this UFO. Until the character told us that actually it was a photograph of the ceiling light of his bedroom that he turned upside down and blurred in the family dark room. He made complete fools of those of us in the East Side Junior High Science Club. So, I've been fooled before. Was the Big Lake UFO just one more hoax? There was that group of teenagers on the scene that sped away, remember that. And teens do love pranks. But how would one transport molten metal in a small foreign car or heated to 2,500 degrees in the middle of a park on a cold December night. And why go through such an expensive and logistic, logistically complicated plan for a hoax less than a dozen people saw? And moreover, why keep it a secret for 40 years? Now, there is a place to seriously research UFO sightings, and that's Roswell, New Mexico. Roswell is home to the UFO Research Center, which collects extensive data on all sightings. Now, I would love to tell you that I take these talks at pace so seriously that in the midst of a global pandemic, I travel to Roswell to study this for you. But in the, in the spirit of full disclosure, I will admit I used to have an aunt in Portales, New Mexico, not far away, and uh, we visited Roswell then on a family trip, and I did read up on the UFO. Uh, also, Roswell is the best place in the U.S. to see aliens, though in point of fact, these are not aliens. That's actually my, uh, my niece Rosalie and my dad. We just love these touristy gimmicks like this. <laughs> Roswell is so cool. Have you ever been to Roswell? You know, every town has to take whatever is unique about them and run with it. Well, apparently the only thing of note that's ever happened at Roswell, New Mexico, was a UFO crash there in 1947, and they're still making the most of it. Okay, so while I was there, I read up on the research that's been done on our UFO. The fellow that had written the most about it speculates the reason the event defies earthly explanation may be that it's not from Earth at all. Though the thought of aliens blowing up their spaceship over Council Bluffs seems a bit far-fetched, Dr. Jacques Vallée, an astronomer who's compiled a database of thousands of sightings, says there are at least nine other incidents that could be explained by an alien object in distress ejecting molten metal. Now, one other thing to keep in mind, what if whatever crashed that night didn't land on the levee? Maybe it landed actually in the lake. Nobody has ever looked in the lake. Maybe what they found on the levee that night was only a small fragment that broke off. In which case, the alien craft and the remains of its occupants are still down there. Now, when these nice, this nice weather is supposed to come back next week, so when you're taking a nice fall stroll along that lake, keep in mind, we haven't had much rainfall this year. The lake's unusually low. So stare down to the depths carefully. Analyze those shapes in your mind. Is that really a fallen tree branch that's sticking out of the water over there? Or envision what a spacecraft might look like after it's been 43 years at the bottom of Gilbert's Lake, or, or maybe some skeletal remains. And you just might be the one to finally unravel the mystery of the close encounter at Big Lake. Well, Council Bluffs, the name Keyline, stood for activity industry and enterprise. George Keyline immigrated from Germany. He became a large landowner, a director of Council Bluff Savings Bank. George Keyline became a pillar of the community, as did his children and their children. Well, except one. John Keyline fancied himself mostly a sportsman, eh, some might say a playboy. Through his family connections, he was officially a bank officer, but his main interest was exhibiting purebred poultry, that and drinking. Now, his wife was growing increasingly displeased, not so much about the poultry, but about the drinking. And she was threatening to leave him, just as his previous two wives had done. But this time, he was determined to stop it. In a drunken rage, he stormed into her bedroom one day. They argued. She attempted to hide in the clothes closet and made the feeble attempt to protect herself with her hand when she saw a shotgun leveled at her head. The blast went crashing through her hand, her jaw, and into her neck. Her sister, who was staying at the house, heard the shot, and she came running to the room, and John Keeline shot her as well. Then he went down to the butler's pantry, grabbed a pistol, and put it to his own temple. Now, there's no doubt it's probably always spooky to enter any crime scene, but survivors said this was worse. 
it wasn't just the ubiquitous blood from where Carla Keeline bled to death, but it was though somehow her presence was still there. It's like she wasn't ready for, to go. She refused to leave. And so the relatives refused to enter their ancestral home. They sold it at auction for demolition. And a church was built on that site. It's at the top of Frank Street, St. Paul's, uh, what is it, St. Paul's Lutheran? Now, <laughs> if a spirit won't leave a house and the house is torn down, what happens to the spirit? Is it part of St. Paul's Lutheran now? Well, I asked a clergyman about this, and he said, probably not. God doesn't really like loose ends, and somebody who's got, you know, a foot in both worlds is definitely unfinished business. Now, about the same time, across town, strange things began happening at the Beersham house. Now, the man who killed Carla, her husband, was John Beersham Keyline. His mother grew up in the Beersham house. His grandparents lived in the Beersham house. He was actually buried in the Beersham family plot. The Keylines didn't want anything to do with him anymore. You don't suppose. If it was Carla Keyline, she certainly wasn't shy. She arrived in the middle of a party. Many eyes saw her appear right in the middle of the parlor of the Beersham house and wash up the stairs in a blur of motion. A lot of people followed and couldn't find anything. But once that happened, once she arrived, odd things became common in that house. Now, to the owners, it became very unsettling to return home and, and find the lights are on when they left the switches off. One day, a mirror was broken. One day, there was flour spilled all over the house, and there was nobody there. And the neighbor worked, uh, worked nights. And he reported that many times he'd come home in the middle of the night and find a shadowy figure walking around and around and around the house as though it was looking for something. They got creeped out. They sold the house and it became a nursing home. Maybe the spirit finally found what she was looking for. The house was a nursing home for 20 years. And after that, the ghost has never been seen again. So did Carla bond with one of the elderly residents? Maybe she found that unrecorded love her short life had deprived her of and, and crossed over with one of the them? Don't know. It remains one of Council Bluff's unsolved mysteries. Newspapers have been historically very important. In fact, the founding fathers of the United States went to far, so far as to call the newspapers crucial to a healthy democracy. Newspapers have responsibility. They have credibility. And in Woodbine, they got a ghost. A woman's voice in the basement of the Woodbine Twiner had long been heard whispering, bring me the papers. One time an employee picked up the words, what's that? on a digital recorder when he was all alone in the office. So after a number of years of such goings on, uh, the newspaper called in a paranormal investigation team. So they spent two days at the newspaper office. Investigators found a gruff voice on their recorder saying, get out of here. When they asked the spirit to give a sign he was there, all of a sudden a computer in the back of the room lit up all by itself. They even got his picture, an orb, which is a floating bright ball of ectoplasmic energy. So the investigators spent two days there. Their conclusion was the Woodbine Twiner office is home to not one, but probably four ghosts. They may not necessarily be all that hospitable, but they're currently harmless, so they left them alone, and they remain there today. So next time you pick up a copy of the Woodbine Twiner, take note that the story you are reading just may have been penned by a ghostwriter. Okay, so what's the appeal of being scared? Why would anybody seek this out and pay for it? Omaha, traffic's scary. Yeah, and I don't hear people say they're going to go out on a rush hour for no purpose other than just fear. So there must be more to it than that. Some people say the veneer of civility is actually very thin, and our repressed subconscious enjoys evil mayhem. Well, whatever the reason, a Council Bluffs fellow has contributed to causing a lot of fear. Plus, native Ernest Shodasat brought terror to millions via the big screen as the director of King Kong, Son of Kong, and Dr. Cyclops. So did something about growing up in Council Bluffs foster the feeling in him that an unconscious, repressed part of every human is actually savage? Although we consciously disapprove of what his monster is doing, deep down, part of us enjoys seeing that murder and mayhem is monsters unleash, because if we could, we'd do that ourselves. A troubling thought, but millions flock to his movies. Scary tales and literature have certainly found an audience for some time. Some hold there's nothing sinister about this that reveals some horrible defect of human nature. We're just intrigued by the mystery, and our minds want to work it out. Again, Council Bluffs has made a contribution. 
uh, including a past historical society president. Elizabeth Dean wrote a number of stories about murder that appeared in Saturday Evening Post, Collier's and Woman's Home Companion in the 1930s, and three murder mystery novels. Murder's a collector's item was selected for Doubleday Publishing's list of outstanding mysteries. The houses that are thought to be haunted have been around for centuries, but generally they were just regarded as curiosities and most often simply avoided. For example, news accounts from the 1870s make reference to a house in Woodbine where windows rattled and doors opened even when bolted. So people just stayed away from it. Now this concept of haunting buildings intentionally for profit is actually a relatively recent concept. Most of us either grew up in an era of haunted houses, so, or, or if we're too old for that, maybe we took our kids. I remember standing in, I remember huge lines with the kids to be shoved through a sometimes cheesy local operation where costume goblins chased us with chainsaws and plastic knives. But the scare you for a fee business uh, actually started out probably with the amusement parks. Playland Park had a ghost train when it opened back in 1948. That's the building right in the middle, kind of hard to see in the photograph. Now, it had a maze, uh, a line of mirrors, uh, where you stand in front of the mirror, make you look short and fat or tall and thin or both at the same time, and of course, plenty of darkness. Movie theaters got into the act, warning sissies to stay home. The Broadway theater suggested its chasm of spasms spook party as the perfect place for a guy to take a date, as it'd be a great opportunity to show her that you're no coward. Halloween fundraisers for clubs and nonprofit groups became popular in the 1970s and 1980s. A group could raise an impressive amount of money in just a few evenings. But a horrible tragedy in New Jersey in 1984 led to much tighter safety codes. This ended the days of the Squirrel Cage Jail as a haunted house, uh, a building whose whole design was to keep people from getting out, no longer past safety codes. Uh, by the way, one of our, our newest podcast episode in the Historical Society's Accidentally Historic podcast series is a history of our local haunted houses. Very good. You should check it out. Thomas Officer was very active in our community. He was a member of the first school board, one of the first elders for the new First Presbyterian Church, on the design committee for a new courthouse and to establish a uh, bank with William H. Pusey. And it's really weird because I normally keep my cell phone on silent. That's odd. Um... Thomas and Elizabeth. It's the ghosts. It's the ghosts. See, it, it, for you non believers, I always, my wife will she, attest, I always have my cell phone on silent. Thomas and Elizabeth, Elizabeth Officer came to Council Bluffs, Illinois in 1856. Their son was two when they came, but daughter uh, Julia, she was born right here in Council Bluffs in 1858. Now, they were the family that entertained Abraham Lincoln when he came to town in 1859. Uh, Lincoln held Julia in his arms. She'd have been about nine months old at that time. Now, Julia had an affinity for music and not much else. Uh, she only did well in school in what interested her, and that was music. So they took her out of the public school, sent her to a special school, and then sent her to college in Illinois to study music, and she began a career as a concert pianist. Actually, she was pretty good. She started touring, even toured Europe, and it was going very well for Julia. Until her eccentricities kind of started popping in. She had this weird habit of having to put on velvet gloves before she played because she said it softened the notes. And then, then this strange business of having to move her face closer and closer and closer to keys as she played. And sometimes she'd turn and glare at the audience as she played. But you know, it didn't really affect things any. Her music was good. People just laughed it off, thought it was funny. Until she started noticing the audience eccentricities and would stop playing and stop and taunt the audience about their eccentricities. Well, that's not a good thing for ticket sales. So she wasn't getting booked anymore. She returned to her parents' home on Willow Street in Council Bluffs. She didn't go out much. In fact, almost never. Uh, the Pusey home next door was torn down to build a library, and that and its books became her new friends. In fact, pretty much her only friends. Except for that walk next door, most of her life was spent right inside that house where she grew up, the house where Abraham Lincoln once cradled her in, her arm, in his arms. And actually, if you've lived in Council Bluffs for a while, odds are you've been in Julia's house. Served many years as the Cutler Funeral Home, not until not that long ago. Now, Julia knew when the kids would be in school, and she went to the library when they were in school because she didn't want to see them. She tried to avoid them because they would point at her and laugh. They made fun of her. Something about her hats and attire. She's still dressed in the style of the turn of the century. Also, the kids didn't like her because 
she was very possessive of the library. She'd stop and chide them if she didn't think they were having proper respect for the building or the books. But the librarians were her friends. And they knew her well. They knew her very well. They became very used to seeing Juliet and didn't give her much thought. Indeed, it was quite routine to catch a glimpse of Juliet toting an armload of books, usually on the stairway, decked out in her Victorian garb, right up until the library closed. But that was in 1998. Julia Officer died in 1940. It's easy to scoff at these sightings. But keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, these are not giddy teenagers reporting this. These are librarians, methodical people who live in an organized world of facts. Nonsense, you've heard the details. Now you decide. Postscript, what became of Julia when the library moved? What was her connection? Was it the librarians and the books or the building itself? Well, I'm not sure because actually her spirit has gone missing. I asked Kathy Rieger, our library director, and she was kind enough to check with the staff uh, for me last week, and she reported back that there have been no sightings of Julia in the new library. So I checked in with Patricia Labonte, director of the Union Pacific Museum at the Carnegie Building, and she said, ditto with the Carnegie, Be uh, Carnegie Building, not a single sighting of Julia. And uh, Patricia added, uh, actually, the Union Pacific Railroad isn't particularly tolerant of ghosts on their property. Now. Julia is no longer welcome then at the Carnegie Building. Hmm, let me share this one somewhat disconcerting fact about ghosts from paranormal researcher Sarah Strain. They have the ability to travel and potentially follow people. There is one <laughs> that follows me around and I have interacted with it in multiple locations. So she's no longer welcome in that building. Think back after you visited the UP Museum the last time. Did you happen to start noticing anything peculiar at your house afterwards? Maybe not, but you know, if you're wandering through your house some night in the dark, maybe seeking a midnight snack and catch a quick glimpse of something, look carefully. Is that something wearing maybe Victorian garb? Who knows? You might be Julia's new host. So there've been ghostly sightings at the Carnegie building. How about next door at the old Pottawatomie County Jail? Or I guarantee you there's ghosts there. We put them there. Uh, tourists love that kind of thing, particularly during Halloween, but I mean for real. Now, a few years ago, uh, some young enthusiastic members of the board of directors at the Historical Society were discussing ghosts at a board meeting. And Dr. Hoff, the incredibly generous, wonderful man whose name adorns the outside of this building, was on our board of directors at that time. And he and I were kind of sitting at the back of the room, and Dr. Hoff leaned over in this discussion and said, you don't believe this baloney, do you? Well, of course I don't. I mean, mostly, I mean, I try not to. Taylor, I'm just gonna tell you what happened, and then you can decide, okay? Museums are a business. And, and with any business, you, you have to balance the revenue with the expenses. And I'm pleased to report we're doing quite well. Even with the pandemic, we're holding our own. But a few years ago, yeah, things were a little tight. We had to do some cutting back. And so one of the things we cut back was trash pickup. Okay, it's not a lot, but it's a little saving. That's before I retired, and I was paying for a dumpster, a dumpster on the side of my office. So I said, I'll volunteer. On Sunday night, I'll make the round of the museums. I'll pick up the trash, put it in my car, throw it in my dumpster Monday morning. And that's what I did. And it was just kind of routine and I'd, I'd stop it uh, my dad was living by himself at the time it's probably mid 90s and one night it kind of took a little longer to get him all situated so I was running late and then I made my round of the museums got to the squirrel cage jail went in the front door and I shot this little video just so you can you can help me figure this out okay so I get the same routine I do this every week I walk in the front door go to the left it's only a few steps to the kitchen there's the big garbage can I keep some extra bags at the bottom so I pull that big bag out throw put in another bag walk across the hall it's what maybe 15 feet into the jailer's office bingo there's the other trash can I take that trash can empty it in the big one and tie it up and leave except I couldn't find my keys you know there's no sense in being a grouch in life. You gotta laugh at things. And so I was running behind, but I laughed anyway. And I thought, you know, I thought of my mother. My mother was always losing her glasses. Usually they were up on the top of her head, always losing her glasses. So honestly, it was kind of funny for about 90 seconds. At five minutes, I was starting to get annoyed. At 10 minutes, I was getting really annoyed. I mean, you can see, this is only a few feet. I keep walking back and forth. I'm wearing a hole in the floor. I took everything out of my pockets. I laid them all over the place. I cannot find my keys. At 15 minutes, I'm getting desperate. What am I going to do? I, I had my car keys. They were on a separate ring, but I can't go and leave the museum unlocked. And then 
I found myself doing something rather strange. Even though I'm all alone in that room, I turned around and said, you guys didn't, did you? You didn't mess with my keys. I don't even believe in you. You couldn't have touched my keys, but where could they have gone? So I decided to search the building. So I went through the building, opened all the doors, left them open. I've never been particularly athletic, but I think if I was pursued by a poltergeist, I could have run pretty darn fast. So I left all the doors open. I found my keys. They were on the second floor. Ladies and gentlemen, I do not recall going to the second floor. I could not get out of that place fast enough. So now, serendipity that I happened to be in that building when my keys went missing, or is there something else going on? Coincidence? You decide. But what is for sure fact is that people from thousands of miles flock to this building to spend the night and experience the unworldly. They say, this place isn't just haunted. This is spook central. Now, what would make a building such a hotbed of paranormal activity. Well, about a year ago, a television paranormal team checked it out and offers this explanation. Because of the pure evil that it has contained, that evil is serial killer Jake Berg. It's because of his supernatural power to put a curse on people and cause them to die. It is called the Jake Berg Hex. Not just the people were victim to Jake Bird's ex, but also the very jail that took his freedom away and served his punishment. Actually, after seeing that, I feel pretty darn lucky they really snitched my keys. <laughs> Whatever the reason, okay, the squirrel cage has gained that reputation as a paranormal paradise, and dozens and dozens of paranormal teams come and spend the night. Okay, now, if one op operates a tourist attraction, I guess you could make a point that actually ghosts aren't bad for business, but a haunted brothel, not so much. 1873, and ever since Jenny Stanley left her position at Harry Williams' fancy house in Council Bluffs, and went to work at Madame Kelly's establishment at 10th and Farnham in Omaha, strange things began happening. Strange sounds, like the falling of water and mysterious rapping sounds are heard every night, and they got the ladies terrified. And it all started when Jenny Stanley arrived. You know, and Jenny always seems nervous. It's like she's holding back some sort of grim secret. Now, for Jenny, it started one night when she was working at Harry Williams' house of ill fame, the Oasis. A cattle drover came in from Colorado. He was just in town briefly, and he kept telling her as they drank how much money he had, how rich he had. In fact, he even pulled out his wallet and showed her this wallet bulging with bills. Well, unbeknownst to him, Jenny helped herself to that wallet while they were drinking, and she said she only kept a little bit for herself. Most of the money she gave to her boss, Harry Williams. So after a while, Jenny and the cattle drover went up to her room, and when she woke in the morning, he was gone. There was a little trail of blood leading out of her room and down the stairs she didn't remember before, but she just kind of dismissed it, didn't think anything of it. But it was the dog that got to her. It, just away from the place was an empty spot, an empty area, and a dog appeared that sprang out any time she tried to walk by. It was creepy. The darn dog never seemed to leave. It just sat by this vacant patch of ground, mournfully wailing and jumping at her any time she tried to walk by. It was almost like he was guarding something, like maybe the unmarked grave of his master. She couldn't take it anymore, so she left Council Bluffs, went to Omaha, went to work at Madam Kelly's. So she didn't have to worry about the dog, but now her co-workers turned on her. They said it was like a ghost moved in when Jenny did. So Jenny was in a state of fright and panic when she called the sheriff, and she told him this whole story. Harry Williams was arrested for murder, but Jenny skipped down. Well, without her to testify, no body and no proof of crime had actually even been committed, Harry was released. Then with Jenny gone, the poltergeist at Madame Kelly's place disappeared as well. But if you're ever walking along that vacant area by the viaduct where the oasis used to stand, and in the wind, you think you might hear the mournful moans of a dog missing his master. Remember the story of that cattle drover and ponder if that field of grass could be the final resting place of a man who came to Council Bluffs for a good time and never left. Well, this program is supposed to be about spooky council bluffs. I don't know how spooky you consider Dr. Demento, but for the Dr. Demento fans, I'll toss out that he does have a council bluffs connection. Dr. Demento's wife, Susan Charles, was a graduate of Abraham Lincoln High School, class of 1969. Everybody thinks hearses are spooky, but when you think about it, nobody ever dies in a hearse. But an ambulance, now that's a different story, isn't it? 
people do die in ambulances. And there seems to be an ambulance right here in Council Bluffs where some of those that died inside have never left the vehicle. Norwich State Asylum in Connecticut was built in 1904 on a site that had been a Native American village. The hospital's population started with just a few dozen people, declared criminally insane, but it continued to grow. At times, there were hundreds and hundreds of patients, murderers, drug addicts, violent offenders, all declared insane. In 1970, the hospital was elated to get a brand new ambulance, a 1970 SNS Medic Mark I. Now, in its 21 years of service, 495 people died in that ambulance. And one person died on the ambulance. Inmate John Franklin murdered fellow inmate Leonard Flannery and attempted to escape by jumping out the window. But in a, he made a fatal miscalculation and landed on the roof of the ambulance instead. He crashed it so badly it couldn't be repaired, but the crash welded the roof back on. Or the, not that roof, they had to use a roof of a junked ambulance, and they welded it on. And they were able to use it a few more years. 1991, a maintenance man discovered the ambulance running, and inside was... Paramedic Leonard P. Anderson slumped over the steering wheel, dead of a heart attack. The makeshift roof flew off a short time later. So it was sold at auction. A troop of clowns in Michigan bought it for 150 bucks. Big vehicle, no roof, perfect for parades. The clowns used it for several years, then put it up for sale. Then somebody else bought it. And in 2008, it was on the market again. And the owners of Shamrock, Shamrock Limousine here at Council Plus find a good deal. Wow, a few hundred bucks for a big vehicle with only 77,000 miles on it and not that far away. So they bought it, wanted to get it. Now, keep in mind, the new Council Plus owners knew nothing of its history. They didn't know about the asylum. It was totally unbeknownst to them that their new purchase actually still had passengers on board. But things started to seem odd right from the get-go. When they towed it back, they broke the tow chain three times. Now, these are people who know vehicles. They tow vehicles all the time. Breaking two, uh, three tow chains is really strange. But it got even stranger as they got back to Council Bluffs. In the garage, people started hearing the loud clang of heavy tools dropping. But there was nobody there. And the batteries of the other cars in the garage would mysteriously go dead. Odd, rusty medical instruments were found in the door of the car and things would fly off the hood for no reason. There were footsteps. They had a creepy feeling one was being watched. So they decided to research the car, and they learned about its life as an ambulance and the many, many people who died in and on their new purchase. So they brought in a paranormal investigation team, which found several spirits, but the most active was that of Leonard P. Anderson. Remember him? He was the paramedic who drove the vehicle, was so proud to get it, and then died in it himself. It's presumed he's there and the most active because Leonard P. Anderson is still doing his job. He's guarding over those patients entrusted to him decades ago, and probably he'll remain in that old ambulance forever, or at least until the last of the spirits of his patients is crossed over. So what do you do with a haunted ambulance? Well, Shamrock Limo had her beautifully restored, and she's more popular than ever. They named her Elvira, and she's the highlight of Halloween parties, car shows, parades, and charity events throughout the metro area. In fact, we very nearly had her parked out front tonight, and things didn't quite come to pass. But uh, I think Elvira's picture was in the paper yesterday. Some folks got married at her up in front of the Black Angel. Not to frighten you, but the devil has claimed a soul right here in southwest Iowa. Emmett Schmidt was born in 1882 and began showing signs of demonic possession right during adolescence. I mean, like a revulsion of holy objects, inability to enter churches and disturb thoughts. The source appeared to be her Aunt Mina, a local witch. Didn't know we had local witches in southwest Iowa, but anyway, Aunt Mina, and uh, she was also in love with uh, Emma's father. So an attempt to rid her of the demons years earlier had failed, but things were getting worse. So in 1928, her parish priest, Father Steiger, summoned Father Reisinger, a friend of his who was an expert on exorcisms, and they wanted him to try again. So it was arranged to have the procedure done at a convent owned by the Franciscan sisters in Erling, Iowa. It proved to be a tough case. Emma burst into a fit of rage over food that had been sprinkled with holy water and began hissing like a cat. She started howling, then levitating. The session lasted eight days and was so disgusting and so violent, several nuns were traumatized to the point they had to be relocated to a different convent. But did it work? No. 
<laughs> for the rest of your beginning. Second session, two weeks later, Emma's head, lips, and face swelled. She began speaking in multiple languages unknown to her. The session lasted seven days. Did it work? No. Father Reisinger tried a third time. On December 23rd, day eight of the exorcism, he commanded the demons in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary to depart. Emma began to shriek. She shrieked, Beelzebub, Judas, Jacob. She opened her eyes and praised Jesus. It worked. Emma lived another 13 years and exhibited only milder symptoms that were quite manageable. Now, this was all documented in Time Magazine in 1936. So this is not some Halloween spook story I fabricated for your entertainment this evening. This is Southwest Iowa history. And she doesn't look like she's trying to kill you. Yet the Black Angel has inspired so many malevolent tales in her time at the edge of Fairview Cemetery. She's standing there gazing west now for over a hundred years. She appears very serene with an expression of sadness or is that hope? She extends her right hand as though she's welcoming the visitor. I think it's the eyes. It's got to be the eyes. See, sometimes they have the disconcerting ability to follow you as you move. Those eyes can imprison the viewer and not release their hold. And then there's the curse of her stare. There are those that looked into those eyes at midnight and suffered an early demise and her occasional flight from her perch when she thought nobody was watching her. Or maybe she didn't care because that fulfills her destiny. She was intended to symbolize continued life after death. So if she's intended to be an angel, why is she taken as being so morbid and mystifying? Maybe it's because she stands at the edge of a cemetery. Maybe it's her uninviting dark color, or maybe the fact that she was, of course, inspired by a ghost. Ruth Ann Dodge, it seems, was prepared for her passing through a series of dreams. She found herself on the rocks of a lonely shore that she'd never seen before. It was a peaceful place with a brooding stillness. She recalled it seemed like nature held her breath while she sat there, like something important was about ready to happen any moment. Suddenly, out of the mist, a boat appeared, moving evenly, steadily, coming nearer, but it was an unusual boat. Didn't appear to have any sail or means of locomotion. Yet it moved gracefully over the water and was covered with roses. Standing in the bow of the boat was a beautiful young woman. She seemed to look at Mrs. Dodge, but yet at the same time kind of looked through her. She was carrying a, a vessel like a Grecian urn, the other arm extending an inviting gesture to partake of whatever it was she carried. Mrs. Dodge declined, and the vision went away. At three nights, the spirit appeared. Twice she refused, but on the third night, she drank the water. Suddenly, she felt younger. She felt uplifted. Music started, angels sang, and she was freed from every burden. In describing the tale to her daughter, she said she drank the water of life, and it gave her immortality. Mrs. Dodge departed her earthly existence a few days later. Isn't it interesting how belief systems vary from culture to culture and person to person. I mean, Aborigines have no problem believing in ghosts, while we more enlightened people of the Western culture scoff at such a thing, yet we'll read the National Enquirer. There's a fine line between imagination and reality. Think about that. The inventor dreams something, and a little while later, it appears on the table in front of him. Science fiction writers, envision crazy things like an invisible world living around us and then scientists discover microbes and viruses other dreamers imagine landing on the moon or landing on an asteroid and it happens you think of somebody you haven't thought of in a while and by golly the telephone rings or an email comes in and there they are so if you believe in something strongly enough can that make it happen so tonight, after listening to these tales of local lore, consider that mysterious forces can cause unexplained things to happen and otherly world beings may circulate amongst us right here in Council Bluff. So be observant as you walk to your car tonight. Keep in mind, your thoughts this evening may have actually created something's reality. Thanks for coming. Any questions about anything? <laughs>